On this week's Shoot the Messenger, building our way out of dependency, where Africa's future depends on road and rail, and awakening the African within you. Hello, I'm Henry Bonsu and this is Shoot the Messenger, an hour of people, politics and global African culture from London to Limpopo and from Georgia to Georgetown. It's all there. Coming up in the next hour, tapping into Africa's wealth. Can infrastructure bonds succeed where development aid has failed? Also on the way, Black History Month starts this week, but how much do you know and does it really matter? The African-American scholar Ashra Kwesi tells us why he's on a mission to raise our collective consciousness. The British historian Tony Talbot will have his thoughts on that. His latest book, History on the Page, aims to give young readers a one-to-one -one with great figures from our past. But first, let's meet our guest. Erica Fremantle is an empowerment speaker and international beauty, health and fitness specialist. And Chris Cleverly has to be one of the funkiest barristers in Britain. As well as practising law, he's a DJ, TV presenter and chief executive of the Made in Africa Foundation. Welcome to you both. You can say hello. <laughs> and that's quite a combination because, you know, empowerment mm -hmm. and international health, fitness and beauty. How do you straddle both of those? OK, basically, I was involved in a major car accident many years ago that left me with no hair yeah. and the amputation of my left leg and over 200 scars to my face. Obviously, after mega depression, one had to learn how to bring themselves out of it. Yeah. So obviously with the scarring on my face, that's how I got into makeup artistry. And being told that I'd never be able to walk again is how I got into physicality. So I put the two together and make it my business. And uh, what kind of women do you tend to target? And what kind of responses do you get? I get major response. My Erica Fremantle brand is global. <clears throat> uh, my objective is to bring out the best in women. After having gone through my own journey, um, I know that regardless of your age, your size, your colour, you know, we all need empowerment. So I just use my skills and my own experience to empower others. And you're trying to break uh, boundaries all the time. You had an event recently at the Olympia, is that right? In yes, London? at the Olympia Beauty Show, I'm the first black woman ever to partner with Olympia. And what I've done is I formed a campaign and it's called the All Women of Colour campaign. Yeah. And it's really educating industry about the needs of women of colour. You certainly got the attention of the women in that particular clip. Uh, when you look at Chris, uh, you see a man of style? Do you see a man who needs to be rebranded with Erica I, Fremantle? <laughs> I definitely see a man of style. And no, he doesn't need to be rebranded by Erica Fremantle, all not right. at all. <laughs> well, Chris, we'll talk about the Made in Africa Foundation and development a little bit later on in the programme. The front pages are in, so let's see what's on them. And the Mail on Sunday claims the army is going to sack 8,000 soldiers next year, targeting the over 45s for dismissal. In The Observer, the Labour leader Ed Miliband starts his conference week by warning the big banks to reform or face being broken up. Onto The Telegraph, explosive claims there from Development Minister Alan Duncan that British aid money is being squandered by EU officials. The Sunday Times carries a warning to Ed Miliband from the union leader Len McCloskey that Labour must reject the siren voices of the Blairite dead. And finally, the Sunday Mirror splashes with allegations of rape and child abuse against the BBC presenter Jimmy Savile, who died last year. OK, let's uh, move from the front pages to your opinions. And, Erica, we're going to start off with the Mail on Sunday. Young Megan Stammers found safe and well. Megan, mm -hmm. what a story. Um, I don't know if people are actually aware that f when she left the UK, she used her mother's passport. That's what the lawyers are claiming. Yeah. And for me, that is just quite... <sighs> I've never seen or heard of anything like that. A 15-year-old using her mother's passport, 37-year-old. So obviously it's been premeditated and pre-planned. Um, what do you actually think of this story? I mean, what strikes you when you consider all the coverage, when you consider her youth, when you consider the, well, some people say the abduction by a 30-year-old um, teacher, Mr Forrest, who will probably claim um, mitigating circumstances. Mm -hmm. Does it strike you as appalling or do you feel there's something so wattish about it? This is what uh, Anne Diamond, the broadcaster, said and was pilloried for doing so on a Sky uh, earlier the week. I actually think it's appalling. Mm. Um, I think it's something that's regularly done, but it's just not talking about, spoken about a lot. Um, 
But I also think there was a lot of planning that went into it. And I, as much as he's the older one, I believe that he was led by her because she wouldn't have gone if she didn't want to go. So they've actually done a lot of planning. But that won't really be a defence, will it be? No. Um, led by her because people no, are not going definitely to say that a 30 year old is led by a 15 year old. No, are they? not at all. But she's obviously got major influence as well. Um, mm. But I think it's appalling. I think it's an appalling what do you think situation. It's well, I think, you know, if, you, if you're 15, you're still in, uh, of the age. and We don't know when the relationship really started mm. to begin, began and whether there was any grooming involved and, you know, how he may have led her along this path, etc., or, or anything about her personal life particularly either. So I think in terms of, you know, who's at fault, who isn't at fault, I think that the situation is, is tragic and I think mm. it's very unfortunate for, for, for both of them, but quite clearly he's in the wrong. I mean, initially, the French police were accused of um, not taking it seriously because, of course, the age of consent in France right. is 15. It's 16 here in this country. But they did do what they had to do. They, got a, they implemented a sting operation, I believe. That's how they managed mm. to capture them. Mm -hmm. That's right, isn't it? That's but what right. about the European arrest warrant? Because there are some people who say, in this country, it's anti-democratic, you can be a British person in Greece and you... Uh, alleged to have committed a crime, you come back from holiday, you're here in this country, and Greek police can re reach out over here and pull you in. But some people say that, that, that we shouldn't accept that here in this country. Well, I think in this instance it worked. It, it was needed and it worked. Um, I just... I have a daughter myself. Yeah. Uh, my daughter's 22, and I just try to imagine her running away with a teacher or in that similar situation at 14, 15. I would have done anything, and I'm just glad that it's in place. All right, we'll move on to foreign aid, front page of The Telegraph, under Alan Duncan, who's an international development minister, is attacking the European Union. Ah. Uh, always a popular thing to do here in this country, what do you say, Chris? Well, you know, looking at this one, I think, um, I think it's probably good that it's Alan Duncan doing it rather than the previous minister, which was uh, Andrew Mitchell, was yeah. the one who just called someone a pleb. I think it was a policeman who right, yeah. at the door, <laughs> which doesn't really bode well for somebody who's, in, who's, who's the minister for equality, as, uh, or creating equality, which... Uh, the, the Department of International Development should be. I think in terms of giving all the money to Europe um, out of our aid budget, I think that's great that they're actually looking into that and asking some big questions. I think it's not enough to just say that we shouldn't have an aid budget, which has been the, the argument that's been put forward in Parliament recently, but we need to look at where it actually goes and make sure it goes to the, to the most important places. One thing that's, that's often said, and I don't know if it's true, but it may well be true, is that the Department for International Development has never actually given any money to a black African-owned business in Africa. Really? Oh, in Africa. Um, it certainly has a, here in this country. Yeah. I know some of them. Yeah, that's right. But, but you would have thought that the Department for International Development may have given some money at some point to a black-owned African business. Um, that's an amazing claim, if true. Well, if it's true, and Would they yeah, defend themselves right. by saying, well, I'm, we I'd, give... I'd like to see what the defence is. Yeah. But the, the, the interesting point here as well is in regard to, you know, the amount of money that's been given to consultants and just sort of rushing through that. Yeah. Um, but, you know, they're supposed to be aiming at giving money to the 27 poorest countries, but you, you've, got, you've got people give, being given money, such as the former detective superintendent at Lancashire Police, has just been given £223,000 um, in connection with his role as a, for anti-corruption. So right. I, I don't know why The Telegraph makes that point, but, you know, hmm. make of it what you will. And, and is the other claim, the key claim, that um, British aid money isn't just distributed by Britain, it also gets put into an EU pool and then the European Union officials decide where the money goes? Well, that's the sort, that's the sort of Tory point on it, which is obviously that, you know, if it's given to Europe, it's a bad thing, but that's not the bad thing. The bad thing is what the Europeans do for it. Yeah. And if they give it for Icelandic holiday parks and... Um, uh, and things like that, and they give yeah. it, you know, then perhaps it's not going to where it should be, which is to the 27 poorest countries in the world, uh -huh. and creating growth for everyone. Many of those in Africa, and we'll talk to you about the Made in Africa Absolutely. Foundation, uh, when we discuss David Cameron and his speech to the General Assembly of the United Nations. Uh, Erica, John Terry, <laughs> I mean, on the Chelsea terraces, we don't have terraces anymore, but when they're sitting down, <laughs> they talk about him being a leader, you know, a legend. But now some people are saying he's a racist, and Patrick Collins in the Mail on Sunday is concerned about the attitude of the England manager. That's right, Roy, yeah, Hudson. Roy Hudson. Well, f you know, I've done my research on it as well, and obviously I've read up on it. And I, <laughs> I believe personally that he's a racist. Um, yeah. I believe that it's gone as far as it's gone, and I believe right now what's happened, it's the right thing to have happened. Mm -hmm. So really, what I'm saying is that um, Roy Hudson. He has to really stand and support what he's been saying to yeah. uh, about John Terry. In the problem that um, hmm, 
he was convicted essentially or yeah. found guilty by this independent FA tribunal of using racist language. His defense, of course, was that he was using it ironically because he believed, um, you know, he was being accused by Anton Ferdinand mm -hmm. of saying something and he was repeating it ironically. But Chris, was there such a defense? And people are concerned that on the balance of probabilities, uh, <laughs> he was found guilty, but uh, when it came to all, a reasonable doubt in a court of law, he was cleared. Well, there you go. That's the difference between balance of probabilities and reasonable mm. doubt. Reasonable doubt means you've got to be absolutely, absolutely sure. And if you've got a very smart barrister, uh, you know, that, and I can, I can think it happened a few times, then they're, they're able to get someone into a very good position on reasonable doubt. Now, the bigger point really is, is he a great role model? Um, yeah. We've just had these brilliant role models at the, the Olympics, the Paralympics, and, you know, and suddenly we've got to give all this money each year to these people who are supposed to be at best entertainers, and are they entertaining when they're racist? Not really. Yeah. Look, I'm just wondering then what the lesson for football is, because we've heard people like John Barnes, England legend, are saying, well, stop blaming f football, stop using football as the whipping boy for society's problems. Is that a credible kind of uh, analysis? Well, don't you use the public's budget to pay for your wages, then? That's well, the answer, isn't it? But, but, that's, but it's a free market. You know, it's not government money. It's money from individuals who go to matches. Maybe we don't here, but um, people are free to choose their heroes, and they do, and they do invest an awful lot of I mean, we say, uh, feeling in footballers. Yeah, but Henry, we, we, we say that it's the private money, but we're talking about an England player. Mm -hmm. And when you put on the England shirt, you represent all of England. Right. And if you're not re representing all of England, then take off the shirt. Some people have been saying this week, Erica, that just because you use racist words occasionally or in moments of stress when playing football at the highest level, it doesn't mean you're a racist. So, for example, in the case of Luis Suarez for Liverpool, he used the term negrito, negrito several times mm -hmm. against Patrice Evra. Mm -hmm. But at the same time, the FA, which convicted him, said they did not believe he was a racist. Is it possible to use racist language in extremists? but not be a racist? I think there's a thing called professionalism. Mm. And I think, you know, obviously one has to do... People deal with stress in different ways. Um, but I always believe the truth comes out regardless whatever you're doing, even if you're stressed out. So I believe that there is a lot of racism in football and in lots of different sports too. Yeah. All right, we're going to move on to, well, different sports. Mm. The Olympics. And yeah. um, people have complained a lot about um, how women are presented and the opportunity to get on television. But the Olympics and Paralympics demonstrated just how many brilliant presenters we have in the female ranks, especially on BBC television. Yeah, well, I think Gabby Logan did an absolutely brilliant job, obviously, along with their other peers. But I think she brought a lot of glamour and a lot of stylism to the actual Olympics as well. Yeah. Uh, do you think that female presenters get judged differently and maybe more harshly than male presenters? Because that's what's often said, isn't it? I mean, people look at their appearance, you know, their hair, their style, their clothing, people like you, perhaps, I in would, a way yeah. that they would never, <laughs> uh, male presenters. Um, well, I actually look at both male and female, that's me personally. But yes, I believe women do get, you know, looked and judged differently. Um, but I, I also think women attract other women too. So if a woman looks a certain way, she will bring a certain audience to the, you know, to the show. Mm -hmm. Chris, did you feel when watching the Olympics that you were seeing women being presented more frequently, more boldly, more robustly uh, than ever before? Well, it was the Women's Olympics. I mean, yeah, the really okay. most thrilling parts of it were after the women's sports. And I think, you know, the women's performance, uh, again, wearing, you know, if, if you were supporting uh, United Kingdom Britain at the time, then you, you were amazed by how many gold medals were actually win, won by the women. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, the emotion, the passion of it all, it's fantastic, yeah. I think it was a Women's Olympics. I agree. Mm. Well, what about the um, women presenters, though? Because people I think often they really came to the fore as well. Yeah. I think it's you know I think you got you got had some fantastic um, presenting done there as well. You know, there's yeah, everyone sort of focuses on the pre presenters, but at the end of the day, it is about the sport. Yeah. But I I think you know they did very well. You yeah. Know? And I think the women did a lot more research, and when they were actually talking about the athletes, they brought out things that men would generally miss. Are you um, comparing uh, um, Gary Lineker, perhaps, with uh, Claire Balding, perhaps? Yeah, <laughs> definitely. That All right, I OK. Who was your favourite female presenter? Well, I think Claire Balding came out as a national hero, didn't yeah, she? Yeah, yeah, that's For right. me, it was Gabby. Gabby Logan? Yeah, yeah. What me. about Denise Lewis? Well, then she was a pundit as opposed to presenter. Yeah, I always liked Denise Lewis. I always liked Denise. Yeah. And yeah, Denise, why, <laughs> Denise did great well. Great presenter. She did, yeah. And, and a great athlete as well. <laughs> and athlete. Yeah. Superb. Yeah. He's, he's blushing now. <laughs> uh, Chris, we skipped uh, through 
Ah, Black Blair, that's something that you need to be doing. Talk, talk to us about Black Blair. They often call him the British Obama, but they've kind of changed the way in which they describe Chuka Umuna. Well, I think it's going to be described in lots of ways as his, as his political career goes on, but these are two positive ones. And, yeah. you know, it's nice mm. to have to start off your career with a few positive statements, such as the Black Obama, uh, the British Obama, rather. Um, he's, he, I think it's, it's, it's great. It's a great statement to have someone like him now coming into politics. It's a fresh breath. I think, mm. you know, a lot about the way that people are looking at the Labour Party at the moment is that they don't feel like there's any real direction or leadership being played. And sometimes you need someone who's got a bit of a statesman-like flair, and if Chuka has that, then let's get behind him. Mm. The big question is, what are people getting behind? Do people, do we know exactly what he thinks about a whole variety of things, you know, whether it's tax and spend, I think international if you go, development? Because yeah. often it's useful for people not to know too much about you, especially at the beginning of your career. Well, I think, I think, there's, I think he knows what he thinks. Yeah. And I think that's clear, and I think that's why he got into politics. I think his role at this stage is to support the other ministers and, 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 and shadow ministers in, in, in the Labour Party and to, to, to tow the Labour Party line to a great extent, because it'd be, it's a bit early for him to start making a move. Um, and I think Ed Miliband's a great supporter of his. Yeah. So we imagine that at this stage he will say the right things. Well, it's rather interesting, this move from British Obama, which he's had for the past three or so years, to Black Blair at a time when Tony Blair is considered to be a toxic brand in the Labour Party. <laughs> well, certainly among the unions, as we know today. Absolutely, absolutely, and, and amongst uh, um, other people outside of the country as well. But, you know, it's, it's important to also remember about Blair, that Blair did great things in Sierra yeah. Leone, that he did great, great things with Ireland, and he actually united the Labour Party, and he took them to, to victory twice. So three times, actually. Three yeah, times, sorry. It? Yeah, so, you know, if, if that's what he's going to do, then maybe that's a good thing for Labour. Are you a fan of, um, of uh, Chuka Umuna? I am very much so, yeah. yeah. Very articulate, very intelligent young man, and I think he's on a very, very serious journey. He has a plan. Also I actually quite stylish. Listen, <laughs> obviously. Doesn't get his seats from Oswald, though. <laughs> <laughs> I, I listened to him this morning on the radio, actually yeah. coming here, and, yeah, very profound young man. All right, we're going to finish with one more story from you, Chris. John Sentamu, the Archbishop of York, the first African Archbishop of York, but possibly not the first African Archbishop of Canterbury. Well, I'm sort of looking at this news story that it's on a Sunday, and I'm just thinking about the sort of church and the Christianity of it all, and it's thought the title is Sentamu's Snub in, in Deadlocked Hunt for Archbishop. And, you know, then, they, then they've given the, 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 the gambling prices as well, 6 to 4 favourite and 5 to 1. And I think, you know, I think they should really just accept that whoever it is, is probably what God chose. <laughs> you think so? <laughs> so no puffs of white smoke then? Because, I mean, there's a real concern about the politics behind all this, because some figures are considered divisive because they're anti-gay marriage, some considered divisive because they're anti-ordination of women bishops. What kind of consensus are they going to arrive at? Well, that's, that's the problem with it. Once you start all the horse trading, everyone's got something, and everyone, everyone's got a positive and everyone's got a negative. Yeah. Um, I, th I think it would be great if Sentamu was, was um, you know, the next Archbishop for Canterbury, but he's Archbishop um, for York, and that's yeah. a senior position, and he, you know, he's ticked a lot of boxes for, for the movement forward for uh, people of colour throughout the world, I think. I'm just wondering, Erica, then, um, do you feel that um, the English Church of England would be missing something if it didn't have uh, Sentamu at the very, very top of it? Because if you consider it's been in long-term decline, mm -hmm. you know, Anglicanism, when you compare it to some of the charismatic, you know, Pentecostal-type churches, mm -hmm. the African and Caribbean ones, which are really flourishing. The pews there are full in contrast to the ageing nature of the Anglican church. What do you think? Um, I just think it's... I think what's going on... I haven't actually been following the story very, yeah. very much, but I think what's going on is quite controversial and quite interesting as well. But do you think uh, at the same time we might not get it because he's an African? Because some people have said that, you know, we cannot have this man at the head of the Church of England. Well, they said that about Obama, so mm -hmm. I just think anything's possible. And as you said, yeah. it's in the hands of God. All right, thank <laughs> you very much. The two of you are unusually religious today. We're going to move on uh, now to some. It's an expensive talking shop for grandstanding politicians. To others, it's an important gathering of world leaders where global crises can be addressed by people with the power to do something about them. So while President Obama condemned extremism and stressed the values of his country, President Morsi of Egypt rejected foreign intervention in Syria and stressed freedoms must be balanced by responsibility. Meanwhile, Britain's PM David Cameron accused the world of standing by while people were massacred. Syria does present some profound challenges. But those who look at Syria today and blame the Arab Spring have got it the wrong way round. You cannot blame the people 
for the behaviour of a brutal dictator. The responsibility lies with the brutal dictator himself. Assad is today inflaming Syria's sectarian tensions, just as his father did as far back as the slaughter in Hama 30 years ago. And not only in Syria, Assad has colluded with those in Iran who are set on dragging the region to a wider conflict. The only way out of Syria's nightmare is to move forward towards political transition and not to give up the cause of freedom. The future for Syria is a future without Assad. A 16-year-old Syrian called Wael, who was detained in a police station in Dera, said this, I have seen children slaughtered. No, I do not think I will ever be okay again. If there was, this child said, even 1% of humanity in the world, this would not happen. The blood of these young children is a terrible stain on this United Nations. And in particular, it is a stain on those who have failed to stand up to these atrocities, and in some cases, aided and abetted Assad's regime of terror. <laughs> Well, Mr Cameron also made clear in his speech that uh, his government would continue to lead on development aid, which has led to a furious backlash from Conservatives here who say the money is being wasted. Uh, Chris, do you have any thoughts on this? Um, not necessarily Syria and what should be done about that because then people aren't agreeing with that. You know, China and Russia say don't intervene. Britain and the United States are kind of thinking, well, we should do something. But bigger problems for the world in terms of the number of people affected occur in Africa. Development aid, people say, hasn't worked. Uh, but the Prime Minister here says we must continue to pour that money in. Well, you know, we're looking at the situation with Syria and we're seeing £63 billion, um, as the defence budget yeah. for the UK. £13 billion is, the, is the, the development aid budget. So if, if you know, the defence budget is what we think is where our priorities are, we should remember that the best thing you can say about defence is that it's a short-term fix. It's a bit like charity. It's a short-term fix. It worked in, for Sierra, in Sierra Leone, as we said, for Tony Blair. This is a charity works after the you know Hurricane Katrina in, in New Orleans. Yeah. But if for a long term fix, it's about development. Let's maybe the word aid is now a difficult word, but mm -hmm. let's talk about development finance. Let's look at ways in which we can build things, grow things in partnership with countries. That's what creates peace. And until you have peace, you can't have prosperity. Defence budgets don't create peace, they just stop wars. So if you at the Made in Africa Foundation had a conversation with David Cameron, given what he said, given yeah. what he's determined to stick to, yeah. would you be saying, well, look, actually, it's not about the money, it's about the development through building things? Because I mean, a lot of people aren't quite sure how the money should be spent. They know that we're spending a lot, and some of it, as you said, is going to consultants, but is it being spent on the wrong things? Well, if you look at what countries have grown very, very fast, they are countries like South Korea, Singapore, what they did was they put their money into the infrastructure. They made it easier for business to function, easier for countries to, to trade with them. And the way to do that is to build railways, is to build roads, is to get things moving from one place to another, because it's no point having a school if you can't get to it, a hospital if the ambulance can't reach it, no point trying to sell something if you can't get it to the market. So once those things are fixed and those things are put in place, then you'll see a country grow and grow rapidly. You know, the first thing China did was build high-speed railways. You know, so that's a, that's a key part of an investment, and I think if, if Britain gets behind that investment, looks how it can help the, the, the businesses that it has at home that are closing. Yeah. You know, we've got house builders closing here, we've got railway companies going bust here. You know, is there ways in which we can actually take the skills and the knowledge and the great engineering that this country has and maybe go in partnership into Africa. Big question is where, where's the money coming from? How's the money going to be raised? Because people have said that Africa needs 100 billion spent in it for the next few years, every year. A absolutely, it's 100 billion needed for infrastructure every single year. 55 billion is covered at the moment, there's a deficit of 40 odd. So the key here is, is where does the money come from? The African Union at the moment is looking at a great solution. They've, they've come up with the idea of putting a guarantee for 22 billion just for infrastructure and the money from that is going to come from Africa. Mm -hmm. Um, we at Made in Africa Foundation are proposing that we find a way in which the diaspora can also invest into that because it's going to be a high quality bond and it's going to provide great returns and it's going to have great security. Um, we're very excited about the, the, the different ways in which Africa and Africans can get involved in helping Africa and I think that really David Cameron should be looking at ways to support that and using it perhaps a, a guarantee with his, his budget to mm -hmm. do that. 
I know that you've partnered with the fashion designer Oswald Boateng yes. at the Made in Africa Foundation. We've got a, a feature-length interview with him next week, which will explore this in a bit more detail. Fantastic. Uh, Erica, I'm just wondering, as a British taxpayer, does it worry you the amount of your taxes that's going into international development aid and it may not be reaching the people? Or do you think, look, if you just keep pouring millions and millions or even billions, some of it will get to those poor people in one country or another? I agree. The, the latter of what you said. Mm -hmm. um, I just believe that, you know, we should come together and give what we can yeah. and to the relevant countries. All right, well, let's mm. hope that spirit mm. endures. Well, something tells me that it's under pressure right now. We'll move on to this because it wasn't all hard work for the PM, obviously influenced by President Obama, Tony Blair and even Boris Johnson. He thought a spot on the late night show with David Letterman would be the perfect opportunity to show the lighter, more rounded side of David Cameron. What could possibly go wrong? First of all, a rural Britannia. Yeah. Uh, written by whom? Um, <laughs> Elgar, I'll go for. Okay. Let's see. Rural Britannia, which is a, a, a beautiful refrain, uh, based on a poem by James Thompson. Are you familiar with James Thompson? Well, I am now. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Magna Carta, who signed it 1215. The literal translation is was what? You have Magna. I, I, again, you're testing me. Mm. Um, <laughs> Boy, it'd be good Find if you knew be. this. Yeah, well, it would be. <laughs> Sun never se sets on the there British There was Empire. a moment when if you, the globe was like a quarter pit. Yes, yes. And that was... Uh, now, did, did, historically, did we look back on that period now as just awful, don't we? I think there was some... There was some... <laughs> There were some good bits and uh -huh. there were some less than good bits right. and obviously, you know, we had a bit of a falling out mm -hmm. Right <laughs> At that time and uh, it was a misunderstanding Hmm <laughs> You two are both style gurus, okay? Uh, the so Prime Minister, that. how do you think he came across there? I'm not talking about his clothes so much, but just the person because the whole point about going on to a show like the David Letterman show is to present yourself as a rounded human being who can laugh at himself I think, I think we, you didn't quite see it in that clip, but he had just come out of the United Nations. He had just been talking about the murder of the innocents. And then he came on to, to the Letterman show and he, he went and mentioned the fact that, that the American uh, ambassador had just been killed and murdered by extremists. Yeah. And Letterman just went and said, instead of replying to it, he just turns around and said, well, let me ask you some dumb questions about America. Right. And he wasn't quite at, at no, the right was, speed was, the to begin with. The gear there, change was, was quite ma massive for him. But then he slipped into it quite well. I thought, you know, it came across as, you know, if you're an American and you don't know anything about Britain, which is, you know, clear that most of them don't, he came across quite well. Right, OK. Did it worry you that he didn't know Magna Carta, couldn't translate it, given that he went to eat and did Latin? Well, maybe he's not going to get a passport for Britain then, is he? <laughs> he failed his, his citizenship. I, I think he came across quite well. I think he was quite jovial. And the fact that Letterman was on a higher pedestal than him, he actually used to be in higher himself. Uh, but I think he came across quite well. All right, you two are just too generous, man. I was oh, savage on him the other day. Oh, <laughs> well, this, is because, this is because, you know, you know, obviously this particular Conservative Party is considered to be very, very elitist, you know, cabinet of millionaires, 40-somethings, uh, to the manner born, and therefore, if you present yourself in that way, you're going to be judged more harshly. Right, uh, who wrote Rule Britannia? It wasn't Elgar, put it that way. <laughs> yeah, exactly. And it was 10 <laughs> seconds ago they said it, and you still can't no, remember. No, 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 no. I wasn't listening to him. I wasn't listening to him. It was deliberate. It was deliberate. Okay. It was deliberate. Yeah, of course it was. Of course it was. I'm, I'm way beyond those questions. Time for a short break. And when we come back, we'll be bringing history to life just in time for October. <laughs>